Hello, uh, welcome all. Uh, I, I feel certainly privileged and proud to uh, chat with Srilita, uh, my colleague and friend. Uh, she is much more than that. She is a writer, scholar, teacher uh, and so on. Here I am going to interview her in her capacity as a writer, but of course her scholarship, her persuasions and, and the rest will obviously come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lovely talking to you. Same here, Srilata. So, uh, maybe we can introduce yourself and then we can start from there, Srilata. Uh, maybe where you grew up, um, when did you first start writing, mm -hmm. that kind of things. Right. Uh, so, I think I've been <coughs> writing from ever since I can uh, remember. Uh, since I was fairly young, you know, I, was, I, used, to read po I used to write poems. Um, really uh, very sentimental, quite awful sorts of poetry I used to write when I was a young girl. Um, and then I went on to writing short pieces. I um, started sending them out for uh, publication also. And slowly I got into writing and that is something that somehow has never left me. I think it is something that I um, have held on to almost all right through my life except for a very short break during which time, predictably enough, I was doing my PhD. I was about to say that. <laughs> <So> <laughs> <laughs> because I think that mm. kind of work took me quite away from the kind of mind that you need to uh, function as a writer. Mm. And I, I think I needed to use my mind for other sorts of things and um, a, another kind of a pursuit or uh, intellectual pursuit by other means, you know. Uh, so there was that, that sort of a break at that point, but I returned to it after I um, got into IIT as, a, um, as an assistant professor, which was about 16, 17 years ago. And uh, I have been sort of at it, I have uh, you know, sort of been writing fiction as well as poetry, more poetry than fiction really. So, um, then that makes me ask this, um, see writing <coughs> is one thing and doing scholarship uh, dry academic writing with end notes, footnotes. Mm. Uh, it's both are different. Mm. How do you handle both, Filta? You mm. are uh, in that sense you are a rare, uh, belong to a rare species who mm. can bo do both. Mm. I'm not sure how well I do both, but uh, the thing is with the writing, I think it's like a uh, sort of a. It's like being possessed by some kind of a demon or something. So you just have to write, and if you have something, I mean, at least that's how it's been with me. Mm. So if there is something that uh, sort of is bothering me, it becomes an obsession, and I have to get it out on paper. So it doesn't let me rest in a way. Mm. Um, and academic work is, um, you know, in a sense equally dear to me, especially the teaching. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't say, uh, you know, that. Um, uh, research as it is narrowly defined today increasingly mm. is as dear to me, but my teaching is very dear to me mm. as is my writing. Mm. Uh, so, I think what we need to do is actually essentially not think of these two things as two Separate. different pursuits, uh -huh. but unfortunately that is how we have come to understand it uh, mm. nowadays. And I think that is that's one of the you know, this, uh, real misfortunes that especially those of us in English studies ironically mm. enough mm. Uh, are, are, face, are facing now that you look at creative pursuits as being, uh, you know, entirely out of the range of uh, academic scholarship and, mm. and so on. And we do not see the connections between the two and I think that is, that connection I think uh, therefore our students also do not, uh, uh, we do not sort of, um, you know, um, acknowledge even to them that that, that connection exists, um, which I think is very unfortunate. And uh, uh, how and by what means we can do that acknowledgement in our classrooms as teachers? Well, I think I, um, one is by, by just kind of um, pursuing in a very unafraid, bold way mm. um, your writing, if you, that is your calling or if that is what you want to do and, mm. and say, you know, I do not care. I mean, if, if it does not get me points in the system or if it does not, uh, you know, if, if people think I am a lesser person because I, uh, I would rather right. be writing poetry or fiction than maybe uh, publishing a research paper, mm. um, uh, you know, just saying, you know, it does not matter if that is how uh, they are going to think about you, that is fine. I mean, it, it really does not matter and you should really uh, do what you uh, should do. I mean, of course, it is easy to say this because I suppose I have been in this field long enough and, um, 
you know, I'm, uh, I also have a, a sort of a stable job and so on. So I don't want to say that everyone <coughs> should do this and that it's easy. But I think ideally we should be able to uh, work towards um, thinking about ourselves in th uh, that way. And uh, I think then that will come, uh, that will also communicate uh, itself to your students, to your scholars um, and, uh, and to others and to a anybody that you interact with. I think uh, I liked your uh, symbolism about persist being possessed by a demon mm. because um, it helps me to understand that you are gripped and moved by something mm. and you want to put it in pen mm. or in painting. Mm. Uh, in which case, uh, that is what we should encourage in serious academic writing too. That's right. Yes. Uh, that modality where you listen to your inner voice mm. and decide your field accordingly mm. instead of going for a field which is fashionable for the mm. for now mm. and mm. therefore you pick it up and do something. Mm. Mm. That's right. I think it's ultimately a search for meaning yeah. and even as you said rightly, mm. uh, even our uh, choice of um, you know academic pursuits uh, should really be driven not so much externally but by what uh, the, the sorts of um, questions we want to seek the answers for mm. um, or the kinds of uh, field that we want to navigate mm. f uh, often for personal reasons which may also be you know which are also not uh, uh, which um, I think uh, it's not just about you making meaning but also in a sense making that meaning available for uh, for others um, and I think academic disciplines and that pursuit of that should ideally also be driven by by that search for meaning. And uh, some demons take you to poetry and some demons take you to uh, right. novel writing. Yeah. But your demon is taking you in all directions, how is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's, actually I think it's kind of does push me more towards poetry than it tow does towards fiction writing. But that may also be a function of the fact that I have a full time job and I tend to write in bursts, in short bursts, in fragmented uh, units of time. Mm. Uh, and and uh, you know, you can kind of uh, manage to write at least a draft of a poem in about say half an hour or an hour, which you can't really do with, with fiction, it doesn't work. You need a longer, you need longer stretches of uninterrupted time. Mm. Um, but I find of late that I'm also, um, you know, um, quite drawn to writing certain kinds of non-fictions. I think depending on what it is that we want to say, at that we, moment. Yeah, at that moment. Mm. One chooses certain mm. one form over the mm. other. Mm. So it the the situation chooses the form that's right. and not the other way. Not the other way, I think, yes. Okay, that's for you. Yes. Uh, because um, see, um, I'm just <clears throat> remembering some interviews in the TV shows about musicians, mm. uh, MS Viswanathan mm. generation, mm. where they used to say, um, well, a musician will hum a song mm. and the writer writes. Mm. And it is the other way also all mm. true. Mm. The writer writes mm. and the musician comes up with a melody that suits the mm. uh, situation of the song. Mm. Mm. So in your situation it seems um, uh, the moment and the, and the sentiment around that piece of writing mm. demands mm, on you a form, a literary form that you would like to write into. That's right, yes. Wow, this is great, Srilata. <laughs> Good to know that. <laughs> and uh, tell me about the kinds of writings you have done. I am sure you can put it better than how I can summarize. Okay, so I uh, maybe I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, my new book uh, mm. of poems, mm. uh, which was published a uh, month, <coughs> couple of months ago actually. Okay. Um, and it's called The Unmistakable Presence of Absent Humans by Poetry Wala, Mumbai. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think like with some of my earlier poetry collections also, mm. um, so this maybe book you can read out to illu illustrate. Yes, I will. Uh, maybe yeah. I, yes, that's that's right. I, uh, thank you. So I might want to actually read you uh, from the preface, if I may. And sure, sure, please go. Um, to sort of, um, in a sense, lay out what the poems are about. Mm. Uh, so one thing uh, I say I've said in this preface is that, uh, you know, when I was putting this collection together, um, I did not really make any conscious attempt to thematically link the poems. Uh, there was no grand narrative uh, informing it all. Mm. Uh, so I'll just, actually I'll just read to you from the preface, it might sure, be easier sure. that way. 
uh, as I was attempting to arrange these poems, I found that one particular idea surfaced repeatedly, the idea of absent presences, mm. absences that are quite unmistakably presences. Mm. So too the ideas of disappearance and enforced often traumatic separation. Mm. It was as though I had been trying all along to find the words for these things. Mm. The absent are always present in our lives in mm. difficult and powerful ways, mm. in ways that we may not always be able to explain or account for. Growing up as a daughter of a single mother, I was acutely conscious of the absence of a father. My mother's challenging life as a divorcee in 1970s India had implications for my own life. It was the shadow under which I walked. For one thing, we were oddities in a world where families meant not just mothers and fathers, but also uncles and aunts, grand uncles and grand aunts, grandmothers and grandfathers on both sides, maternal and paternal. Mm. So what was a constant presence in our lives was the absence of people who we felt ought not to have been absent. I think people experience absent presences as an itch and in my case I used poetry to get at it. Mm. This is also perhaps why I have tried to imagine what absences might mean to the lives of characters in mythologies Sita's twins Lava and Kusha, for example, or Penelope, the wife of Ulysses. I have also been haunted equally by the question of what forced disappearances must mean to people in, in a conflict-ridden zone such as Kashmir. Mm. And I have found hope too, as in the story of Atta Muhammad, grave digger and caretaker of unmarked graves <coughs> in northern Kashmir, mm. a story that eventually made its way into the poem, I bury them under the witnessing yellow of the Chinar. There is yet another absence, a d disappearance that we have of late started to experience, that of the ideals of social equality and secularism. Disappearing before our very eyes is an India where it had once been okay to dissent. This disappearance too has found its way into some of my poems. So this is re essentially what the book is about. And I noticed after having, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, worked towards this collection for, for some years mm. that this idea of absences of various sorts mm. was what informed many of the poems, not all, but many of the poems in the collection. So, um, and, and then looking back at my earlier work uh, as a poet, I think that um, perhaps the same holds for that, that sense of blankness which I felt mm. for uh, a variety of reasons was what actually was fueling my work in, mm. in a sense. Mm. And the novel, the first novel that you wrote. That's well, right. Yeah. Okay. This was the first uh, novel again. I mean, it was, um, um, you know, it, it, it very peculiar kind of uh, background to it. Mm -hmm. um, because I spent just a short, very brief one year in, in California, in Santa Cruz, a small town, mm. university town, <coughs> as a student on a Fulbright uh, pre-doctoral scholarship. Uh, and right through the year, uh, you know, I think I was kind of, um, I, I found it very difficult, I was very homesick, I wanted to just kind of run back home and I had many um, housing challenges, you know, because I, I had to kind of find a, a housemate, I, 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 I got into a very bad housing situation and all kinds of things happened and by the time, you know, things sort of settled down, it was time for me to leave. I know. Right? And, and <laughs> I think it probably happens to many of us and correct, it correct. was my first uh, ever, um, you know, sort of stay outside the country and, and all of that. And, and it was also the days before Google, before uh, YouTube. So, you know, you had, we had no idea what and the US meant. before even proper telephone. Before you know. telephones. And <laughs> I had never seen a supermarket, you know, yeah. in my life before mm -hmm. that perhaps. Mm -hmm. So, so many things were new and, um, you know, annoying also in some ways. And, um, and uh, yeah, and, and I was just profoundly uncomfortable, I think. So, I came back to India and promptly after that I got married. I had, uh, got, uh, had a child. I, I, I started working in IIT. And somehow I uh, sort of managed to forget all that. But in the novel, strangely enough, um, what uh, you know became the setting of the novel was Santa Cruz, where I, as I said, I just spent a year and a very uncomfortable year at that, right? So it uh, it came from that. So again, um, you know, it has all these uh, um, characters, and Maya perhaps is is the character that is uh, closest to my own voice. I think mm. uh, you know she's trying to sort of do a PhD and um, she has this very strange uh, tenant, uh, sorry, uh, landlord. And, uh, you know, and it, it's a book about different people and their s stories, their secret inner stories, which they then decide to share. So that's, that's what the novel is about. It's a, it's a loosely connected um, set of four stories, really, more than a novel. Mm -hmm. yeah? So that's what, uh, that's what it is about, actually. See, whenever I read your 
poem. Um, I browsed few online um, you know, yesterday uh, and even before. Hmm. I, I, uh, this absent presence makes a lot of sense now. Hmm. So because uh, that was indirectly uh, inducing that sense in me that you are up to that. Hmm. But now I hear from the hmm. um, author. Hmm. Um, see, you have, um, I, I want to use this word, uh, respect mm. for intuition, mm. sense of intuition mm. Mm. and what is appropriate to the intuition you want to bring that out, mm. um, say as a figment, mm. uh, say as a, a story mm. sometimes. Mm. Um, and uh, along with the intuition I also see um, a concern for, a concern uh, shown by mother, mm. a mother figure mm. or a parent figure coming out in many, many stories mm. about raising children, mm. sending them to school. Right. Mm. Um, uh, do you want to say something about it, Srilata? Um, yes, in fact, uh, it's interesting you should ask me that because um, I think the next book that I'm, you know, actually thinking of planning right now, uh, so it's early days. But uh, the next book that I'm uh, hoping to write mm. is uh, partly non-fiction, partly fiction. So it's, it's going to be a mixed genre kind of book mm. where I actually explore this idea of uh, children who don't quite neatly fit uh, the school system especially. Partly this comes from person, the personal experience of, as you said, being a parent and you know raising children in this very difficult and competitive uh, environment where for a variety of reasons, uh, they don't neatly fit the system, you know, uh, and uh, they don't kind of manage to get straight A's and that kind of thing. Uh, and then also discovering along the way that uh, it's not as though there is something wrong with the children, but with really with, with, a, with a larger system. Uh, system in place, which yeah. allows for only a very, very narrow bandwidth of um, skills or abilities and um, really disallows so many uh, different sorts of competencies. Human possibilities. Human yeah. possibilities, you're, uh, yeah. you're absolutely right. And, I think you're a scholar of uh, in disability studies and you would understand this also from a, a, a certain perspective. Uh, it, it's a spectrum, entire spectrum of people who get left out or left behind um, in our education system, also social systems of various kinds. Uh, and I find that increasingly enormously troubling, I mean, um, because I think you're, you're literally cast out, you know, and you, uh, unless you have somebody who can mentor you through that or navigate it for you when especially when you're a young person or a child uh, who really doesn't know how to operate who wouldn't know how to operate in this complex world you uh, you know you can just fall through the cracks and um, for no fault of your own essentially so this book that i'm thinking of writing actually uh, partly a personal account but also partly attempting attempting to also reach out to um, and I don't like to use the word sage stakeholders, but really <laughs> everybody is a stakeholder in a sense mm -hmm. in this thing. Uh, because there are so many parents, so many other educators um, who feel this, who, uh, who, are, who are beginning to get the sense of, you know, something is not quite right. Um, Intu and by intuition. By intuition, by yeah. experience and by intuition. Yeah. Yeah. And there are also at the same time no easy, quick fix solutions. It's not as if you take the child out of this school and put him or her in another school, you know, take them out of Montessori, you put them into mainstream or take them out of mainstream, put them into a so-called alternate school, everything goes away. No, it doesn't because you find that there are blind spots, there are, you know, there are issues with almost every kind of um, uh, system. and. This is a deep flaw, I think, in, in the larger uh, so social systems in, in a way, which um, again, it's not clear to me that there is one solution or um, it is just that we all navigate it very, very imperfectly in our own small ways. And I think it's important to have a larger conversation about uh, how do different people uh, view this? How do they see it? What have they done, you know, if it's uh, be it special educators or teachers who work in mainstream schools or uh, parents of children with different kinds of disabilities or uh, or different sorts of intelligences even, you know, if uh, uh, that's how to, we want to put it. Uh, I think it's important to have, have that conversation. Uh, I was reminded of this uh, story, you expert woman, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, at the end of the story, actually the narrative mocks at the notion of expertise. That's right, yeah. Uh, the expertise is rather with the child and the mother. Mm. You know, yes, and, and yes. not otherwise. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. 
uh, yeah. uh, well, that's the, actually the crux of disability studies. Yes. Uh, it's about um, experiential knowledge yes. and intuition and logic and rationality yes. that builds on it. Yes. Not yes. otherwise. Not otherwise. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's your own knowledge that you create and yeah. you. Um, yeah. So I, I find that fascinating because especially, uh, yeah, with you know whether it is uh, children, young people people with uh, disabilities or uh, parents and care caregivers and so on that we all uh, I mean you know sort of you're thrown into this and you come up with the most incredible of solutions which Correct. somehow the, the systems don't recognize I mean they, you know actually the, if, if only our schools would learn to look at those mm. solutions that are coming from there mm. rather than this top-down thing which you know they are uh, trying to just push put it put down push down our throats I think things could change a little you know in fact uh, it's good that you mention, uh, you put it this way. Mm. It's good that you put it this way because mm. Mm. now uh, disciplines like disability studies mm. is moving away from uh, talking about moral in imperative mm -hmm -hmm. or uh, mm. social constructionism about disability okay. to disability as a knowledge in itself. Mm. Yes. Uh, because you yes. invent solutions, yes. you create pathways, yes. you manage, you create new temporal new temporal temporalities, right. you create new spaces. Mm, mm, mm. Um, suppose I'm uh, bedridden, mm, mm. I will have a creative way of engaging with a child to switch on that fan. That's right, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, yeah. so uh, things like that. Mm. So it's interesting that you, um, your poems and stories and mm. uh, your entire concern mm. um, Apart from intuition, it is always to do with caregiving. This is what I've noticed mm. in your writing. Mm. And mm. I think your experiences as a mother and, mm. and you experiencing your experiences as a child, mm. all mm. coming out very mm. uh, vividly, Srilata, mm. uh, and Thank beautifully you. too. Thank you. Um, now, um, um, see, how do you, how these concerns seep into your scholarly work? Your, hmm. uh, so far, I think we have talked about balance between um, uh, different modalities of performing. Yes, right, but yeah. uh, I want to know hmm. what are the spillovers to academic side. Right, yeah. right. So this book that I was just telling you about, hmm. um, I, I think it, it would be located, um, uh, I don't know if you call it borders or whatever, but it's not, um, it's meant for a also lay readership. Uh -huh. But uh, I'm also hoping to be able to draw on um, various kinds of uh, scholarly approaches to everything from special education to maybe disability studies and, and so on and anchor it, uh, draw on those insights. Mm. Uh, but, but I'm not thinking of um, writing this very terse, typically academic kind of book, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, mm. so I think it would be in, in, in its own way maybe also a scholarly kind of uh, engagement. Mm. Uh, but in a way that doesn't uh, exclude a whole lot of people, um, you know, from being, being able to access the book, uh, especially for the people who might find this useful in some ways. Uh, so I don't want it to be just an internal conversation uh, within academia, mm. but uh, for it to be able to reach out um, to practitioners in the field to, I mean, I don't know how it's going to turn out. It's, as I said, it's really early days. But, um, so I do see this as, um, you know, scholarly in its own way. I mean, mm. as a scholarly engagement in its own way, yes. I wanted to ask this because this is a um, troubled question mm. in, I mean, at least humanities people see it as a troubled question. Mm. Uh, it need not be outside. Right. Uh, they always talk about the problem of representation. Mm. Mm. Uh, who can represent, who who cannot represent yes, whom. Yes, uh, yes. Does these questions uh, directly talk to you? Yeah, they, it does. Uh, they do. Uh -huh. uh, and so, just to sort of, uh, you know, come back to this book. So, what I, uh, I felt is therefore hmm. that uh, I'm not in this, uh, in this book uh, actually going to uh, even um, try and represent uh, children 
young people, people with any uh, sort of quote unquote disability or whatever, right? Yeah. I, 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 my starting point and <laughs> whatever, the way I'm going to navigate this entire difficult terrain yeah. is by uh, saying, look, I'm a parent Correct. Um, uh, who, uh, you know, who's had certain challenges Correct. Uh, raising uh, children. children. Mm. And, um, you know, this, that's the starting point of the book. Correct. And, uh, and I've also found that uh, where I have been helped to an extent by talking to so-called experts in the field and, and so on and so forth, uh, that has never been enough. And what has actually helped me is uh, by talking to, uh, to my own children, uh, talking to um, other people, other parents, uh, as you said, you know, their own experiences and so correct, on, correct. and the kinds of different kinds of knowledges uh, that that has given rise to and so that that is what has helped me so i'm in fact going to have uh, hoping to do a series of interviews and also invite pieces by um, others so it's not a book um, where you know i yeah so i i wouldn't i wouldn't be able to do that i i, I don't think it's i would, should be doing that either to represent uh, other. it's a very fraught uh, thing i can only begin with myself and see where that uh, has led me I think. I think uh, so. Uh, that opens an interesting way of looking at things. Hmm. Uh, I think we should stop looking at representation as a uh, uh, monolithic thing, hmm. where hmm. Uh, um, uh, people from a particular identity group hmm. have the final say on the matter. Hmm. I think we should abandon that idea hmm. and hmm. say uh, any human problem. Mm. Uh, there are multiple entry points mm. and mm. your entry point was as a caregiver as a parent right, right. And, yeah. and, and we, we should democratize that mm. modality of thinking mm. about representation. Mm. 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 Uh, that is what I learned from your yeah. Uh -huh. And allow also for, as you said, allow for different entry points. So I'm yeah. hoping the book, if it ever gets done, will allow for, you know, different kinds of uh, entry points and, and leave it as an open book and, and as an ongoing conversation because there is really not one answer or not one solution to any of these things. There are just many ways of looking at it. All the best for your book, uh, Srilata. Thank you, thank you. Hey. I, I thought I can have the privilege of reading one of your poems and yes, then... Yes, yes. Um, I, I picked it up, this poem, by random. Hmm. Uh, it's called Green. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Take me to a meadow, she says, from inside the thick smog of the car. The word newly acquired, though the dream is perhaps old. But the light is stuck at red. We, we are dying even as we wait. And we have no idea when or indeed whether. Well, very short mm. but um, very quickly passed poem. Um, uh, there are many poems like this by you. Uh, mm. it, it feels like a waking moment from a dream. Mm. Uh, interestingly, there's the word dream here. Yes. But uh, do you write while dreaming? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> when I go to bed, I just sleep like I'm dead to the world. <laughs> but I do sometimes write out of dreams. But, uh, you know, there are a mm. couple of poems when I've done that. I have some vivid dream and then it just seems so fascinating. And if I'm, uh, I think like, happens to many of us. Sometimes you remember them, sometimes you don't. Mm. The, uh, and sometimes you remember the whole thing and it's this like fascinating puzzle or the sequence of things that happens in your dream and mm. then you end up, uh, you know, writing from there. Uh, yeah. Kubla Khan moment. <laughs> <is>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, see, one thing this struck me, this poem was so much of uh, color, mm. smog, mm. red, mm. green. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I think when you get into a mode, mm. you actually get into a painting mode. Mm. Mm. And when, it, when you get, get into sentiment, it's full of um, um, uh, the color of the sentiment. Mm. When you get into uh, this kind of a uh, picture, mm. uh, I find your poems very colorful. Mm. Is that, w did you think yeah, that way? Yeah, they are. I mean, there's a lot of blue and as you say, <laughs> green. <laughs> yes, yeah. and there are birds. And, and you know. it's the, the dream quality of your poem is very vivid. Mm. Um, mm. I somehow mm, reminded of Imagist mm. poetry mm. Um, <clears throat> where when I read your poems. Mm. Uh, and that's very different from, so I think you answered it earlier. I'm not going to ask it again. Uh, mm. I think the form, uh, the situation demands the form. Mm. And <clears throat> uh, 
and you are there with it. Mm. <laughs> well, um, finally, uh, as we get uh, to the end, um, what about your teaching style? Um, do you, do you have uh, what about your teaching life? I am not going to say teaching style, mm. but teaching life. Um, do you dramatize in your teaching, or do you read your? <laughs> how, how does it go, Shilata? No, I don't think I dramatize uh, at all. Um, mm. I um, I guess like many of us of that generation. I, dr uh, you know, sort of drifted into academics and drifted into teaching because ah, that's one of the few things, you know, if you have yeah, a, yeah. an English degree, then you either teach or you teach get into ad agencies or you get into journalism. Yeah. So, I yeah. got into teaching and, uh, and then I got into it and then I said, oh my God, I'm here. What do I do with myself now in the classroom? Uh, and it's always, even now, I think I, there are moments when I get, when I freak out and I get really nervous before uh, class and so on. Mm. Uh, and I, <coughs> I'm not uh, somebody who can just wing it very easily. So, I, I have to prepare. Sometimes I, uh, you know, yeah, I, I do prepare quite a bit for most of my classes. Even when I'm repeating a course, I think that happens, I think, to all of us. That, all you know, us, you yeah. go there and… Every day is different. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I think there are certain challenges. Uh, literature is one of the hardest things to teach, though nobody seems to uh, acknowledge. See, acknowledge that yeah. at all. Because you, um, I mean, what is the teachable thing about literature? You know, so much of it is fuzzy, so much of it is um, subjective reading and, uh, you know, literally really getting, not even getting, I don't want to use this word getting, but yeah, getting the student to sort of be able to engage with the text and so on. And uh, um, sometimes you will have a class where uh, there are people open to the text and sometimes they, they don't want to read, they don't want to really read or engage with it. So, I think those are challenges that all of us face in a literature classroom. Correct. Uh, and that leaves you this, you know, sort of a perennially a, some kind of a nervous wreck, <laughs> I would say. But having yeah. said that, mm. I think um, in all my 16, 17 years in IIT, my happiest moments have been in the classroom. And, mm. and I think that's where I feel, uh, uh, you know, most at home when I come into IIT. Correct. correct. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I really, I. Uh, like the energy of the classroom, I like the energy of, um, I think, just interacting with uh, new peop students um, semester after semester. I like the rhythm of the semester, I've gotten used to it uh, and I think I miss it. I'm on leave now for a while and I really miss that rhythm already. So, um, th that happens. So, I don't know, I'm uh, not easy to say what my style is or anything, but uh, I, I, I think depending on the course, for instance, when I teach my creative writing course, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot more non-talk time where students actually sit down and write and in uh, peace and quiet. I, I think do that's that too important. Uh, yeah. in my class. Yes. Yeah. So, I've learned that I mm. think after all these years mm -hmm. that, um, you know, in order to earn my bread, I don't have to talk right through those 15 minutes. I still do that in some of the classes. Sometimes. Sometimes you because you feel, yeah. oh, you have to kind of fill their heads with things, which is not right really. I mean, because they, they're quite capable of having their own heads filled with things, I think. But I still do that sometimes. But uh, the writing course, I do very little of that. We read a lot. And then they get a lot of time to write. So, I use, try to use different methods depending on the course, I think. Great. Um, maybe a line or two uh, uh, about creative writing courses in India. Um, I think, should we uh, mimic the West again to get creative writing courses here? Or we can do something unique to our own situation? Yeah. So, um, this is, I think, um, been true of the last three, four years I notice, especially among younger poets who I uh, interact with, that um, there's a tremendous drive or um, some ambition or whatever you call it to go and do uh, this writing programs, uh, MFAs and so on, either in the US or in the UK. Correct. Uh, even at the cost of, um, you know, I mean, at an enormous financial cost, frankly, to to themselves and their families. And usually and so these on. programs are more expensive than That's others. That's right. They, they're expensive, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very, uh, hardly any funding and, and all of that. And hardly a job after hardly that. Hardly a job after that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I must say I don't quite understand that because I think you need to write out of your life uh, really and you, uh, if you if you look sharp about you and you look, uh, look, use all the resources that are available to us now thanks to the internet really. Correct. And all books being available on Amazon and all of that kind of thing. I think you you will be able to chart your way through this uh, writing thing as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I do. Uh, it's nice, of course. I mean, I, I think it's lovely to have a whole year to yourself to just sit and write, go to a classroom where you can just sit down and write and so on. 
Uh, but and it's have not a feedback. Essential. Yeah, mm. and have feedback. But it's mm. not essential, I think, mm. absolutely. It can actually sometimes be, I think, counterproductive to professionalize it too much may not be entirely a good thing, is my Maybe uh, bits in bits and pieces, mm. it can write, start right from the school to the college. That's right, yes. Uh, where yes. Uh, that faculty of mind yes. uh, can be cultivated systematically right, right. from the bud. Yes, yes. Maybe that's maybe that a That might way be a to better go. approach. Yeah, oh. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Wonderful, Srilata. It's, uh, it's funny uh, talking like this because I, we, we see each other every day. <laughs> yes. But, uh, <laughs> but it's also an important space to put down yes. things uh, yes. straight. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much you for so your much. lovely questions Thank and you. personal yeah. questions. Thank you.